Hi everyone, it's Amy here from the blog I Think Therefore I Teach. Welcome to your next philosophy instalment. This one is for gender and theology and it is Mary Daly. Now I have to admit I have been preparing myself all day to do this video because it is such an intense topic from Mary Daly. Uh, I have to admit I do really like this one still. This is one of my favourite topics but she talks and talks and what she says is pretty controversial which means that it's great for an essay but you also have to be very careful that you control yourself over the material and the matter and not get carried away. So without further ado let's get going. Rosemary Radford Ruth can be found in part one of this video. I have not done them both together simply because Mary Daly has so much to say on her own. Right, gender and theology it is then. So this is where I start with my students. And so before we even cover Rosemary Radford Ruth, um, we have a look at these. So some feminist theologians suggest the patriarchal understanding of Christianity is mistaken and that a better truer non-sexist interpretation can be found christianity needs reinterpreting without the patriarchal elements cleansed of its distorting features which is a bit more like uh, what reuther is arguing and finally christianity is intrinsically sexist and so flawed it should be discarded with all its sexist practices and beliefs which is more the daily route but before we even look at the names with my class i get them to write down strengths and weaknesses of taking each of the above perspectives I then get to do a bit of research, who is Mary Daly and who is Rosemary Radford Ruther, what is feminist theology and find three further Christian feminist theologians. So these are good just for a wider understanding. Right, let's meet Ms Mary Daly. First thing I get my students to do then is to work around this very famous quote that she's known for saying, if God is male, then male is God. The divine patriarch castrates women as long as it is allowed to live on in the human imagination. Now, this quote is jam-packed with discussion elements. So first of all, I get my students to write the quote down and write what it means in their own words. I get them to write down what is meant by divine patriarch and um, what the word castrate implies why has she used the word castrate who is she referring to by he is allowed to live and finally do you agree so obviously if god is male the male is god is very very popular in the exam it's very commonly used the second part not so much but again any part of that quote is definitely recommended to use in your exam mary daly versus god Men have, throughout history, sought to oppress women. Religion and Christianity is used as a tool to enforce this oppression with one patriarchal divine personal God who combines sexism, racism and classism to create a three-headed monster. Now, that section there, one thing that you have to get in your mind quite quickly, and this is something that I get my students to consider throughout this topic, is yes, men have, throughout history, sought to oppress women. That, that is correct. There is a lot of evidence for that as far as laws, the fact that way that women are tr have been treated. So there's a lot of evidence. I'd find some evidence to back that up. Religion and Christianity is used as a tool to enforce expression. It has been. Christianity has been used as and Islam and many other world religions have been used as a tool to enforce this oppression. But the question then is, is that the religion's fault? Is it religion's fault that it's used as a weapon? Is it a religion's fault that it's used as a tool? Yes, religion and Christianity should talk about things that could be used in a bad way in the first place, granted, but is it not the patriarchy that's using Christianity in a bad way rather than Christianity itself being at the core of the problem? And obviously she blames Christianity as the core. She blames it as the weapon. She blames the weapon itself. So it's kind of like, again, do you blame the gun or the shooter? Is it the gun's fault? Is it the religion's fault? Or is it the shooter's fault? Is it the men that use it as a weapon that's the problem? So that's the first thing to consider. Second of all, what I get my students to do is I get them to find biblical passages that back up the sexism, racism and classism. What you will find is sexism. Yes, there's quite a bit in the Bible that can be that can imply sexism. Racism and classism not so much there is not that much racial issues within the bible nor is there a lot of class issues so she kind of goes there as a spearheaded three-headed monster idea that making christianity into this picture but actually she doesn't necessarily have an awful lot to back up all of those statements 
Women need to get beyond religion. The biblical and popular image of God, patriarch in heaven who rewards and punishes seen as God the Father, has spawned the oppression of women. I love the language Mary Daly used, spawned the oppression. What a good phrase. Daly criticised early church leaders and so-called fathers of Christianity, uh, Christian tradition, sorry, for their anti-feminism, including Tertullian. Tertullian was an early Christian theologian who saw women as the devil's gateway. That just sounds like the great, a great name for a film or something like that. Responsible for the fall and the reason why Jesus had to die for everyone. Now, we know that Eve gets blamed for so much. We know that Eve, St. Augustine blames her, St. Paul blames her. We know that Eve gets blamed for, an, uh, for a lot of things responsible for the fall. But then the reason why Jesus died for everyone, I don't remember Jesus dying on the cross going, this is because of what women have done. Mm. Augustine suggests women were not made in the image of God. Aquinas saw women as ill-conceived males. Uh, Martin Luther suggests Adam was Lord of all and Eve spoilt this. The woman came along and spoilt all his fun. She then makes the statement, I just, when I was writing this PowerPoint a few years back, I, I couldn't believe some of my titles of these slides. God should be castrated. Just... Just a brilliant phrase to say. I mean, she is so out there in what she argues. She says that we need to remove the old androcentric, androcentric meaning male-centred language, remove God as father and the maleness of God. So basically taking the maleness away from God, castrating God. Even modern day theologians are not safe from Daly's tongue. She also attacks many other people. Bonhoeffer, for example, you know, the man that give, gave his life to die for what he believed in and discipleship and obedience to Jesus and about how you have to give over. Yes, even Bonhoeffer was not safe. Is accused of insisting that women are subject to their husbands. He lived in the 1930s, they kind of were. Is that really Bonhoeffer's problem or the fact that he lived in a male patriarchy? Bath is accused of claiming women are subordinate to men. Pope Pius XI is accused of linking women to the role of mother, not formalistic or materialistic equality with men. Joseph Fletcher, you know, Joseph Fletcher, who goes out on, on an argument about agape and an unconditional love for all. I don't think I saw in the small print it said unconditional for all unless you're a woman. But what Mary Daly argues is is accused of making a male-made theory focusing on individualism rather than liberation of women. Now, I love I love that criticism against Joseph Fletcher because it's just absolutely ridiculous in that it's like she found every male philosopher theologians out there and just thought how can I criticize them so he's accused of making a male made theory but Joseph Fletcher was male he can't make a female made theory when he himself was a man focusing on individualism rather than liberation of women she she is criticizing him for creating a theory that isn't to do with liberation of women but that wasn't what his theory was about. He never set out to create a theory for not liberating women. He set out a theory focusing on agape for everybody, not just men. So I think some of her criticisms are slightly unwarranted and unmerited. Basically, the entire system of ethics and theology is the product of males preserving a sexist patriarchal society that explicitly oppresses women. One of the main parts of Mary Daly's argument then is on what is known as the unholy trinity. You need to know this. You need to know the unholy trinity. Trinity meaning tri, meaning three. The first of these stages is on rape. So what I get my students to do is I get my students to actually have a look at what rape is defined as in the dictionary. So I get the, my students to look at how the dictionaries understand the idea of rape and how the law understands rape. So the dictionary.com says that it's on the unlawful sexual intercourse or any other sexual penetration of the vagina, anus or mouth of another person with or without force by a sex organ, other body part or foreign object without the consent of the victim. Oxford Online Dictionary says the crime typically committed by a man of forcing another person to have sexual intercourse with the offender against their will. So what I get my students to do with these quotes is to 
discuss and think about according to these definitions can a man be raped by a woman this is not something that's been very recognized by the law and it still isn't by the 2003 statement that a man can't be raped by a woman so is this actually not inequality are the rape definitions not actually unequal when it comes to men now the first definition there really emphasizes this idea of without the consent of the victim and it's just some sort of sexual penetration so the first definition could go for both male against female and female against male the second one however is what is the crux of the problem when it comes to rape is that it actually specifies typically committed by a man now yes it is typically committed by a man but that isn't always man versus woman it could be man versus man so again there's an inequality there that rape is only associated with females but again that backs up her argument that backs up what Ruth and um, what Daly is trying to argue but what you could say is hang on a minute rape is not just done against women by men and so again you can add some variation to your discussion there section one of the sexual offenses at 2003 so the law the elements of rape are a intentionally penetrates the vagina anus or mouth of another person b with his penis b does not consent to the penetration and a does not reasonably believe that b consents so again this one makes it very clear it involves a penis so it means that the man is doing it against somebody else it's the man that is the rapist a woman cannot be a rapist and so again is that inequality or is that just accurate you can discuss that in an essay um that idea then as well that a does not reasonably believe that b consents they either consent or they don't consent how can it be a reasonable way well, I, um, I wasn't sure whether they were consenting or not so i just went ahead anyway so again the law has many errors and problems there so you can use this for and against daly's argument um what does mary daly then say daly mary daly presents the idea of rapism you must know your key words when it comes to mary daly this is a culture of rape this is a symbol of all violent oppression within a society that encompasses uh, encompasses yeah encompasses there we go nuclear arms race racism man-made poverty and ecological disaster so we're even blaming uh poverty on men that men have made poverty that it's man-made that it's created by our society um ecological disasters so who knew rape meant so many different areas as well leaders of society daily calls them sovereigns of sado society fabulous love that uh love love the love the language she's used there because it just elicits so many ideas and she, it really is just such passionate and emotive language um, who use culture, religion, politics, the professions and media to erase female power and oppress them in a state of grateful dead. This is beyond the father toward a philosophy of women's liberation. So it's the idea there that we're lulling women into being just grateful dead. So I get my students again to work out why are they called Sado society. What does Sado imply? Obviously links with things like Sado masochism, which is again violence often towards females. Um, and again, why did she call them the grateful dead? dead what does that imply why are they grateful why are they dead and this is not just rape in theoretical terms as in physically um sexual contact against consent and against will she also talks about systematic acts of physical violence towards women gentle mutilation foot binding widow burning and hysterectomy now this powerpoint is jam-packed with discussion possibilities and my students have a really enjoyable time delving into these ideas and so one of the questions i get them to talk about is should rape be classed with these ideas as well is it fair to talk about these things in rape or should rape be talked about separately or you know should these be part of it and do you think that genital mutilation foot binding widow burning and hysterectomy all go together is it a fair comment to make so obviously female genital mutilation are we talking about there about male genital mutilation as well there's a lot of arguments that say that circumcision should be classed as genital mutilation but again she's not focusing on the genital mutilation of men only the genital mutilation of women so yes you can argue that um, male genital mutilation does not um, cause 
cause death infection and it's legal whereas female genital mutilation is illegal often then done illegally to very young children and therefore causes death infection etc so we can you can definitely argue you know why maybe one is worse than another one but they're still both forms of genital mutilation she completely ignores what's done to men only focusing on what men do to women so there's a real disparity there foot binding is absolutely horrendous obviously genital mutilation is as well but foot binding is one of those that i didn't really know that much about until i started to research it whereas female genital mutilation is one of them that you do you do hear horrible horrible stories about foot binding is done in certain countries where basically women are given shoes that are so small that they're toes grow underneath their feet so their feet are absolutely tiny and so basically they're just kind of the top of the foot and the toes are crushed underneath and basically this is the idea that it makes it very very hard to walk very very hard to do things it limits the freedom and the power that the women have got um, and it's a very old tradition that is only against women widow burning is is the traditional idea of when your husband died you threw your body on the burning coffin or whatever it was so you would be burnt alongside your husband and then hysterectomy now hysterectomy is the one that stands out there as doesn't quite belong does it the idea of hysterectomy and genital mutilation she's putting them in the same category is it fair to put hysterectomy in the same category many many women have hysterectomies because of cancer many women have hysterectomies because actually it's for their own health and well-being whereas obviously mary daly is arguing here that hysterectomy is done by men to women now yes some women have had to have forced hysterectomies etc um but then again some men have had forced um castration so again is hysterectomy fair is she forgetting about you know men in this that also get persecuted for being male she focuses purely on women and forgets about men unholy trinity and rape continued it's not just men who commit rape but armchair rapists who through pornography are metaphorically raping women this mentality of rape is also part of this culture of violence this culture of rape leads to a sexual caste system a hierarchy of victims females are dominance in sex males this happens through sex role socialization where children are constantly reinforced through school work home entertainment and adverts and interactions now going back to this there's a lot that you can discuss about this so you can discuss the idea that it isn't just men that watch pornography for example females also can watch pornography it's not just a male centered thing you can also discuss that pornography and prostitution are quite different as in prostitution it's often women that are very very vulnerable often addicts etc um, often are controlled by pimps etc but pornography not so much pornography nowadays is very much controlled by women think of um, the popularity of only fans etc this this pornography actually is very very um controlled by women they make a lot of money from it it's their career it's their job yes it still may be not up to everybody's taste yes it still might not be glorifying women as um, you know in the way that we want to but this is still talking about women making money making their own decisions and if that decision is to go into pornography often that's not a pressurized uh, that's not because of pressure that they've been put under by men and if they want to use men in that sense to make money and men then watch it and are armchair rapists well they're reaping the rewards from the money that they get paid so again you can talk about how yes maybe historically pornography was was very much a vindication a vindication against women but nowadays maybe it is maybe it isn't get some statistics to back it up rape and the bible of course she's not just talking about men versus women she is attacking the bible and christianity at the core daily draws upon the example found in judges scoundrels arrive at a house demanding to abuse a guest staying and the host offers his virgin daughter and concubine this is very similar to another story as well where um, the story of um lot when when the angels go to lot's house and he offers again the virgin daughters uh, to them i will bring them out to you now and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish 
They leave the daughter but rape the concubine to death. Is this a fair representation of how the Bible speaks of rape? So at this stage, I get my students to just think about, is this a fair representation? She's using this as a fundamental example of how rape is at the core of the Bible and therefore women are just abused, used by men, etc. And so therefore how the Bible promotes a patriarchal view of women. Now, then I get them to find any other passages in the Bible that would support this passage selected by Derek. So I get them to see if they can find any other examples of where um, where women are misused, where women might be raped or offered for rape, etc. Et I get them to look around the laws around rape. Um, one of the things is, is that if a woman is raped, she has to marry the rapist. That seems very, very unfair on the woman, etc. So again, there is all the passages in the Bible that you can use. Then I get my students to read Deuteronomy 22 um, and what this passage says about rape as well. That might be what I'm talking about with the rapist, uh, the girl rape has to marry the rapist. Um, what I would also highly recommend you do is read the remainder of the story in Judges. Now, this is one of the big areas that I think Mary Daly falls down at. Yes, that is story is horrendous. Yes, that story of how the concubine is raped to death is awful. The bit that she misses out is what happens after the story. And what happens after the story is the man who, the scoundrels arrive at the house, the man whose house it is, is absolutely outraged. Outraged of what they have done to his concubine to the point where he gathers all of his village up and they hunt the scoundrels down. They have this massive fight, war potentially even, and they go after the scoundrels. I can't remember whether they kill them or, or not. I imagine they do because they are so outraged by what these men have done. She misses that bit off. So yes, he should never have offered his daughter and his concubine, However, because of what they do to her, the men are so outraged, they basically honour her by killing the men that have done that. One thing I do get my students to look at, which is a slight side link, is the caste system in India. A Dalit, meaning oppressed in Sanskrit and broken and scattered in Hindi, is a term for members of lower castes in India. The term is mostly used for the ones that have been subjected to untouchability. Nearly 167 million Dalits live in India. Dalit people are at the bottom of the hierarchical caste system determined by birth because of karma. 13 Dalits are murdered each week, 5 Dalit homes are burnt down, 6 Dalit people are kidnapped or abducted, 21 Dalit women are raped each week. And then we look at an article as well about how women are mistreated in this society. Now obviously India is very much based on Hinduism, but this is the way that societies are structured. This is not against the religion, this is the way that society and the patriarchy deal with people. And we're not just talking about women here, we're talking about men and women. But the caste system is a very interesting system of looking at how women are treated so the fact that 21 Dalit women are raped each week that statistic is massive yet nobody cares about them nobody the, the law etc doesn't do anything about it because they are untouchables they're seen as the lowest people because of something horrible they did in a previous life and they've been punished um, because of karma in this life but what you've got to recognise as well is, is that these women are being raped by probably not necessarily Dalits. They're, they're raped by people above them in the caste system. It's a bit like in the Holocaust, women, Jewish women were often raped by the soldiers, by the... Um, by the Sonder Commando, no, Sonder Commando were uh, Jewish workers, by the Gestapo um, and the, the, Nazi, the Nazi soldiers, yet they were still seen as disgusting, lowly people that deserved to be killed in the most brutal ways, yet you could still rape them. And so there's that real contradiction there about where women should be treated, but this again is a patriarchy, not necessarily a religious issue. This is not necessarily Christians, Christianity's fault. It's the way that men have oppressed women within society, in the way that men use women. Mary Daly then on genocide and war. 
patriarchally possessed women are lulled into the sleeping death from God the Father. Such women have forgotten the reality of the gross inequality that daily calls a genocide. So again, that quote is fabulous. Patriarchally possessed women were, were possessed by the maleness in society, by the male lauders that rule over us. And we are again lulled into a sleeping death. We go along with it just like we're zombies again. Um, you know, eternally grateful the grateful dead daily believed there was a deep link between rape and genocide genocide is the deliberate killing of a large group of people male sexual violence forms the basis of military interests a raped person is no longer an individual but is instead part of a group of raped people it is not an act on the individual, but an act on one group against another, males against females. Therefore, an expression of the dominant group, the rapists. In other words, genocide happens because of the need of men for violence linked with sex. And also rape can be seen as genocide, the killing of individualism becoming victims of rape. So genocide is the deliberate killing of a large group of people and what Mary Daly is arguing is that rape is a genocide you're killing a group of people females individualism so they just become rape victims victims of rape you are killing their identity they are no longer the individuals that they are they are just now the rape victim what she's also talking about there is how the sexual violence within men is what makes them want to go into the military I think that's quite offensive that we're talking about um, men in the armed forces, in the RAF, you know, the army, the the the, the marines, etc. The 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 drive to get them to go into this is this need for sexual violence. These men protect our country. Obviously, I know that there's women in there, but she's attacking men. But these men protect our country. They protect our liberties, and she's attacking them, saying that the reasons they've gone into um, military is to help with this sexual violence that they've got. Daly argues that there is a connection between the mentality of rape and the phenomenon of war. She identifies accounts of conflicts in which rape was a product of war, such as hundreds of thousands of Bengali women raped by West Pakistani soldiers in 1971. Daly continues to, the, to point out the link between rape and war in the Bible, where Moses is enraged after a campaign against Midian because the commanders had spared the lives of all women. Now, don't forget, Daly is using these arguments against Christianity. She wants Christianity to crumble. She wants Christianity to be removed from society because that will then help with the patriarchal views or certainly that's what she believes but what she is she often like the examples that she uses are not linked with christianity so the the bengali women raped by west pakistani soldiers 1971 that is true but again that's men against women how is that christianity's fault um there is examples throughout time of um pillage and rape with when it, whenever the the romans the vikings the you know any group of people they always pillaged and destroyed the towns that they went to and the women were often raped captured and killed etc that is just the way of the time i'm not i'm not saying it's the right thing but i'm just saying it is historically very very common why because women are um, and again, don't hate me in the comments, but we are physically weaker than men. You cannot overpower a man. And so women were often attacked by the men. Um, and often because as well, if women were attacked, it really, it hurt the men as well and made, made them weaker because their women were being attacked. And so historically, this is what men have done to women. But is it Christianity's fault? Can we blame Christianity for all of these ways? Or is it the patriarchal's fault? The Bible, of course, she does bring in, and she uses this one from Numbers 31. Now kill all the boys and kill every woman who has slept with a man, so not a virgin, but save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man, so keep the virgins for yourself and kill any women that aren't virgins. War is an inevitable result of male-dominated politics. Daly believes that language has been corrupted when killing a human in war is just, but killing an unborn fetus in abortion is unjust. This is because war is defended by phallic morality and phallic mentality. Love that. Basically, penis-driven morals, penis-driven mentality, uh, reasoning. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Just 
just the language is 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 fantastic that she comes up with and in fairness to Mary Daly I can kind of see the truth behind this most wars have been started by men men are in charge so maybe it's just because men are in charge that wars start and if a woman was in charge the wars would have started anyway but it does the the the, the evidence is there that when men rule countries war happens and you can give the example of what's currently happening in russia with ukraine this is this is again putin male um, and so you can use these as examples of when male dominated politics do lead to war i also think she's very accurate i rarely think daily is daily is accurate i also think she's accurate for a second to last bullet point there the idea that language is being corrupted so you have something called the just war theory. Aquinas mentions things in the just war theory and it's basically justifying war when, when killing is just. But then there are many, many times, there's many countries where um, abortion is seen as unjust because you shouldn't kill an unborn fetus. So why is it justified to kill in capital punishment? Why is it justified to kill in war, but it's not justified for a woman to do something that she wants with her body? And often, whenever you've looked into abortion, I do recommend you look into it as well. Find the countries where it's illegal and find out the proportion of men on the voting bill for that. You often find that when a the bill has majority males making the decision, they are anti-abortion, but that's because it doesn't affect their body and it is the woman's body it affects so that's a i think a very interesting point a few discussion points then i get my students to consider do you think if women ran society that this would result in less or no war and genocide do you agree with daily that men justify war and killing based on a phallic morality they think with their penis is christianity sexist and do you think daily should call herself a feminist so do you think what she's arguing is actually feminism and is christianity sexist from what she's argued is christianity the problem so the liberation of women then women need to seek liberation from moral hypocrisy how become radically deviant in the face of patriarchal expectation this includes rejecting all moral standards because they're designed by men to subjugate women the injustices and inequalities that oppress women are bound up in these male moral standards laws are made by men therefore don't follow them be radically deviant against these laws she says to be female is to be deviant by definition in the prevailing culture. To be female and defiant is to be intolerably deviant. This is equivalent to assuming the role of witch and mad woman. Now, I got my students to Google what deviant and defiant means. Are these qualities that we want as women to do? And do you think this is the role women should take? Do you think that assuming the role of witch and mad woman is a fair statement and again we take this this apart um first of all okay uh, again witches can also have been men men were persecuted for being warlocks uh, warlocks not just women but obviously the majority were women and um, yes that was done by the church um quite predominantly um against women so the role of which in what she's saying is that women were persecuted by christianity um so there's a fly um, women were i didn't get it um women were persecuted because by men called witches and burned at the stake so that is accurate in, in what she's arguing there that we should now take on this role as witches stand up against the people that want to fight against us burn us for our beliefs etc and mad woman now interestingly if you google um the reasons why people were put into mental asylums years ago um, most of quite a lot of them were um, significant female things so for example females were put into um, institutions and deemed as mad women because of things like um, arguing back to husbands um, menstrual pain or, or menstrual uh, anger and things like that so there's quite a lot of them that are very female or would be mainly uh, something that a woman would experience and yet she was then deemed as mad and institutionalized so again persecuted by men in society so she's saying we now need to um, take on these roles but to be defiant and deviant with them 
So what are her conclusions? Jesus is the symbolic legitimization of rape of all women and all matter. Hands down, I could probably write a whole paragraph, probably even a whole page on that quote alone. She is blaming Jesus for being the figurehead of rape of all women. Now, interestingly, the and again, I don't want to say all of them because I might be incorrect, but the 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 majority of passages that Daly picks are Old Testament. They're not New Testament. She would really struggle to find something in the New Testament from Jesus specifically that legitimizes the rape of all women. Jesus, don't forget was the one that liberated women. He was the one that healed the bleeding woman. He was the one that stopped the adulterous woman being stoned. He was very close to his mother Mary. He was, um, he Mary Magdalene was one of his key people at his side. We can probably assume that his mother and Mary Magdalene wrote books, but it was the patriarchy, it was the male-driven writers of the Bible that probably edited it so that the female books were not mentioned in the Bible. Um, again, something that we can assume, but we don't don't know any evidence of this but it's the idea that again was it Jesus's fault that this is the bible that came after him is it Jesus's fault that this is the way that his teachings were then used later when Jesus himself could not have done more to help women to break down the barriers between himself and others um, to show that everybody was equal so to say that he is the legitimization of rape of all women seems very very unfair how does she draw this conclusion? Because of the underlying culture of rape, genocide and war is impregnated within Christianity itself. And these elements are so fundamental to Christianity that leaving this culture means leaving Christianity. Are they really? Are these really the fundamental teachings in Christianity? Again, for me, it feels like she's merge Christianity with the Old Testament. Yes, Christians follow both the Old and New Testament, but Christianity itself is New Testament. Christ is... Eanity, as in it's based on Christ. The New Testament is Christ, hence why, why Jews do not follow the New Testament. They only have the first five books of the Old Testament because they don't recognise Christianity or Christ. And so the New Testament can be seen as not impregnated with rape, genocide and war. That's very much the culture of the Old Testament. So this seems very, very unfair and slightly inaccurate as well when it comes to going after Christianity. Yes, Christianity has been the source of a lot of problems. Yes, Christianity, there are things within the Bible, but this was not Jesus himself. The Bible was written after Jesus. The Bible was written hundreds of years after Jesus by translations, by different people. It was then edited by men. Is this Jesus's fault then that Christianity has been used again as a weapon? And what I mentioned to my students as well is, does this mean leaving behind all of history? Because all of history is again impregnated with rape, genocide and war. The things that we used to do to one another are horrendous. Not in the name of Christianity or religion, but the, just in general, the things that we used to do. Um, you know, the torture mechanisms, the, like, like we said, crucifixion, um, burning witches, the idea of... Um, you know, being hung, drawn and quartered, all of these things are not to do with Christianity, it's to do with the society that people lived in. Spirituality experienced through nature. The maleness of God needs to be overturned so no more priests, male mothers and traditional holy places built and run by men. Instead, we should focus on quintessence the highest essence of being which lives loves and creates you need that on your fridge the spirit that permeates all nature giving life and vitality to the whole universe that is such a tree hugging statement if i've ever seen one if you do a bit of research into quintessence it's quite interesting to see the different definitions of the actual word itself but basically she's promoting living loving and creating this is very much again the Gaia hypothesis idea um, this is very Wiccan based very paganistic which again is is the angles that she was going down there should be a turning away from the maleness of God and the fixed nature of sacred places towards a spirit of quintessence found in the whole universe through nature in the 1970s, there was a renewed interest in pagan spirituality and nature worship, and this is reflected in her work. 
She called women to ignore the oppressive taboos of patriarchy and connect with their wild side, embracing paganism and eco-feminist witchcraft. Simon Chan, however, challenges daily. There's only a couple more slides left to go. You're doing very, very well, everyone. It is not as simple as saying God is male. He argues that Christian idea of fatherhood is embodied in the Trinity is unique. Daly seems to gloss over, according to Chan, the focus that God is the heavenly father and creator of all. He is the universal fatherhood. This isn't that God is male. God is just father of all. He is the creator of all, both men and women made in his image. This isn't just the idea that God is the father, therefore God is male, therefore male is God. That is completely taken out of the context of what the language actually meant. Chan reminds us that the male language for God does not create masculine qualities for God. For example, in Isaiah 54, God is husband who acts with deep compassion. Deep compassion being seen as more of a female quality. So God is talked about in both male and female terms. By implying that God has no feminine qualities implies the idea of a distant and impersonal deity. The God that we worship, the God that we love within Christianity, has both male and female qualities. So has both the male and the female. To say that God is just male, God is just father, removes all the motherhood qualities from God as well. Finally, we have Elizabeth Schlusler uh, Fiorenza, probably terrible dis, um, you, uh, pronunciation of her name there. Um, you can just call her Fiorenza though. I love this argument. I mentioned it in the Rosemary Radford Ruther video as well. Fiorenza, which, who was a <coughs> sorry feminist theologian, suggests an alternative to reading of the biblical texts and the sexism present in them. She argues that the Bible supports women's struggles against patriarchal sexism, such as when Jesus breaks sexist customs. So again, even if there's bits against women by men in other parts, the New Testament, or certainly what Jesus is to do with, seems to actually break the sexist customs rather than promotes them. And she gives this example. So she argues that Daly's approach is mistakenly narrow. While Jesus was in Bethany, this is in Matthew 26, while Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? What she has she has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always um, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be also told in memory of her. So I love this story. You can just imagine it, can't you? So Jesus has just had his tea. He's reclining back in his chair. Oh, thanks for the grub. He then gets avalanched of perfume all over his mouth, his ears, his eyes. Oh, got all of this perfume. And the disciples think, oh, what a waste. Hey, Jesus, you know, could have given that money to the poor. Hey, right, wink, wink. And Jesus thinks, hmm, I've got to handle this very, very carefully now. The disciples, the men, are going against this woman. They are arguing that she has been wasteful and what she's done is not right. And so then Jesus, rather than going down the patriarchal route and supporting the men and going, how dare you, woman, what a waste, I didn't ask for this, he, he thinks no. And he supports the woman, he defends the woman, and he says that what she has done for me is amazing. She has thought about me. She has anointed me. Yes, he is a bit Debbie Downey, you know, preparing me for burial, etc. Jesus, you're having tea. You don't have to talk about dying all the time. Um, but what he's talking about there is how the disciples, the poor will always have the disciples, but they will not always have Jesus. And so what she has done is for Jesus himself. And for that, he is very, very grateful. And so they need to go out and again, preach the gospel in memory of her, of the amazing thing that she's done for him. And the idea again of equality and recognising this as a blessing that he's been given. 
what a nice place to finish the PowerPoint on. Right, I hope you found that useful. Give me a thumbs up if you did, questions below if you've got them. And um, Otherwise, I hope your revision is going so well for your up and coming exams. I will keep doing some more videos as and when I get a chance. Otherwise, that is Mary Daly Donor. Um, hopefully you have enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed this topic, but it is quite a hefty one. Otherwise, thanks very much, everyone. Bye for now.